Thanks for joining us for today's live stream service. We pray that you'll be edified and uplifted by today's message. We want to make sure during this time that we're connected with you. So if you haven't already, please take a moment to like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and like us on Instagram. And don't forget, if you need to update your email, phone number, or contact information, please do so at newhopechurch.net. Online giving is also available at newhopechurch.net. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy the service. by now God you would have reached down and wiped our tears away stepped in and saved the day but once again I'll say amen and it's still raining as the thunder rolls I barely hear you whisper through the rain I'm with you as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I'll praise you in this storm, and I will lift my hands, for you are who you are, no matter where I am. And I will tear, I cry, you hold in your hand left my side and know my heart is sore I will praise you in this storm I remember when I stumbled in the wind you heard my cry to you and raised me up again my strength is almost gone I can't find you as the thunder rolls. I barely hear you whisper through the rain. I'm with you. And as your mercy falls, I raise my hand and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I'll praise you in the storm. from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Oh. And I'll praise you in this door. Good morning and welcome to New Hope Community Church live stream service. We're grateful that you chose to participate with us this morning. We as a church family want to make sure that we stay in communication with you. So if you have prayer requests or anything else, 
any other needs that we can fulfill, then please let us know through the Connect card. If you go online to our website, newhopechurch.net, there's a resources tab, and under there is the Connect card. If you fill that in, it'll go directly to our church office. If you want to bypass that, you can email at office at newhopechurch.net. Thanks for joining us this morning. We hope you enjoy the service. Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love Destined to die, poured out for all mankind God's only Son, perfect and spotless one He never sinned, but suffered as if did all authority every victory is yours all authority every victory is yours Say Every bit.
Again. Well, good morning, everybody. I trust that you are keeping up with our prayer requests. I believe those are being posted online with our Facebook bulletin that we do every week. And uh, I'll try to send out an email as well this week and give you some updates of several folks who have uh, had some interesting health challenges over the last week. Uh, what I want to do today is just highlight a couple of special events that are coming up. Uh, as soon as this service is over, as soon as I shut up preaching, uh, breakfast burritos are going to be available in the parking lot. This is a drive-through, help-yourself uh, event. Uh, burritos will be on the table. There'll be a couple of people supervising the tables. You'll drive in the parking lot. And they'll give you directions which way to go. You'll drive by the table. You're going to have your choice of uh, bacon, sausage, chorizo, or meatless breakfast burritos. Uh, there's also some fresh salsa that's been made that will go with every burrito. There is not a charge for this breakfast meal. It's by donation only. And all of the resources are going to help our junior high kids go to summer camp at Hume Lake. Uh, as of this moment, summer camp uh, is still on starting in June. Everything for the month of May has been canceled, but things for June, July, and August are still on the calendar. That may change, but we are planning as if it doesn't. And so we want to help our kids be able to go to summer camp. So come by, help them do that. If camp gets canceled, we're going to use the money, the resources, uh, to provide some kind of activity for them during the summer. So it will all go towards our, our youth ministry. Next Sunday, that is Mother's Day. It'll be the most unusual Mother's Day I have ever celebrated. Now, as you know, I have never celebrated Mother's Day as a mother but I have celebrated it in honor of my mom. And next Sunday will be most unusual. Uh, we're not sure how next Sunday is gonna completely play out. So stay, stay tuned to Facebook and to your email and we'll give you all the specifics uh, by midweek, I'm sure. What we do know is this, we have Mother's Day gifts for everybody, for every woman who wants to come through the parking lot between 10 and 11.30 next Sunday. Come by, it's going to be just like the breakfast burritos, but you don't have to leave a donation. It's just our gift to all the women of the church. You don't even have to be a mom, all right? Uh, if you're just one of the women of the church, come by. We've got a special gift for you. It's actually one that several women requested last year after Father's Day. I know that sounds odd, but that's the way it turned out. So come by and pick up your free gift. Also on Mother's Day, besides the free gift, there's something we have done for over 20 years here. And that is, we have passed out baby bottles on Mother's Day. This is a fundraiser for Pregnancy Care Center. And uh, it's called uh, Change for Babies. What we ask you to do is to take your baby bottle home on Mother's Day and put it on a place that you'll see it every single day. As you go buy it, take all the loose change out of your pocket, drop it into that baby bottle, and bring it back on Father's Day. Uh, and so that's where the name Change for Babies comes from. But here's the deal. You don't have to put just change in the bottle. If you want to put bills in there, you can do that. What I mean by bills is not your PG&E bill or your AT&T bill, but I mean a $5 bill or a $10 bill or a $20 bill or a $100 bill. You can also put a check in the bottle if you would like to and bring it back that day. But it is a very, very important fundraiser for Pregnancy Care Center. They thought they weren't going to get to do it this year. Uh, we called them up and said, hey, we still want to give them out. And so uh, their dates may be stretched, but we're still going to attempt to do it from Mother's Day to Father's Day. If you're not able to get by and pick up your bottle next Sunday on Mother's Day, along with a free gift for the ladies in our church, you can come by the office later in the week and pick it up or the following Sundays as maybe we began to start seeing some changes of how we do things, get back to something that is more normal. But once you know about the next couple of Sundays, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you for the emails of encouragement that you send to us. And uh, we're excited about what God can do in and through His church during these very challenging and troubling times. God bless you. Have a great day.
Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed. Thanks for joining us today as we learn the lessons and promises God gave on the mountains and how they can get us through the valleys. This is a new sermon series by Pastor Tim Rowland, Mountain Moments for Valley Walks, Lessons for Life's Rugged Circumstances. And now let's join Pastor Tim for today's sermon. Well, good morning. It is the first Sunday of May, 2020. It is unlike any May we've ever experienced before. 
and it'll be exciting to see what God has in store for us over the next couple of weeks. I have a few questions as we kick off this month. You're going to think maybe they're a little goofy, but uh, they might be important. What's your favorite? Vanilla or chocolate? What's your favorite? Beef or chicken or vegetables? What's your favorite? Summer or winter? Spring or fall? Are you a Ford or a Chevy person? What's your favorite? Uh, Mountains or beaches? You see, there's not a right or wrong answer to any of these questions. They're simply a personal preference. I have one great aha moment on the beach. Just one. You want to hear it? It was Carmel. It was sunset. It was with the uh, Panamarencos who used to be in our church years ago and now live in Texas. And right at sunset, it was awe-inspiring. It, it was the handy work of God like I had never seen it before that moment. And we stopped and turned and watched. Not only did our party stop and turn and watch, but everybody up and down the beach stopped what they were doing. No more frisbee throwing for the dogs. No more running and playing with the kids. No more trying to catch a, an, another wave. Everybody stopped, turned west, and stared in awe. During that moment, I looked to my right and I looked to my left because it got quiet. Not only had the people stopped, but every dog on the beach was staring west. It was incredible. We watched the sun from being a full ball drop below the ocean line. Five, six minutes, everybody on the beach stood, stared in awe. I couldn't help myself. I whispered to Nick, who was standing next to me, and I said, watch this. And on the third clap, the entire beach, as far as you could see, right and left, broke out into applause. God got honored that day. Some folks didn't even know who they were applauding. They were just in awe of what they had witnessed. Well, I have one aha beach moment, but I have dozens and dozens and dozens of mountaintop stories. From church camps to retreats, from watching the sun rise in Idaho above the Salmon River on top of a mountain called the Gospel Hump. And it was Sunday morning. <laughs> it just doesn't get better than that. I've been on hikes in Glacier Park, Montana. I've had lunch above the tree lines. And I've been all the way to Mount Katahdin in Maine to see the colors change in the fall season. So as you can tell, I'm one who prefers the mountains. We're introducing a new sermon series today, and by the time it's over, I hope you become a mountaintop preference person, at least when I'm talking about spiritual landscapes. You see, mountain moments are very, very necessary to surviving and thriving our daily living in the valleys of life. We need invigorating lessons for the rugged circumstances that life often dishes out. You see, the Christian life It's a series of mountaintops and valleys. And the way up is not always a straight path or an easy road. There are lots of obstacles and challenges along the way. But once we finally make it to the summit, we realize the effort was worth it. The climb was worth every aching muscle, every drop of sweat, every anxious moment at the top. The air is clear, the view is spectacular, and the achievement of getting there is incredibly satisfying. Call it perspective, because once you've arrived, the mountaintop experiences are fresh and invigorating and fulfilling and inspiring. The old hymn says it so well. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day still praying as I'm onward bound 
Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. A couple of the other verses of that old hymn go like this. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where those abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. I want to live above this world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught that joyful sound, the song of saints. Where? On higher ground. I want to scale the utmost heights. I want to catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I hope over the next several weeks, our feet find higher ground. So often throughout the scriptures, God met his people And he pointed them to a better future from the vantage point, from the clear perspective of a mountaintop. Looking back on my own life, I celebrate as I remember those uplifting, elevating moments when it seems that you can reach out and almost touch God. Every Christian should seek the summits and desire this higher plane of living. Zig Ziglar, some of you might remember him. I'm showing my age by the fact that I remember him. Zig Ziglar was known as the greatest salesman who ever lived. Zig Ziglar wrote a lot of books. He sold lots of products. What a lot of people don't know about Zig Ziglar is that uh, he was a member of Dallas First Baptist Church. And for probably over a decade, Zig Ziglar taught the largest Sunday school class in the world. He had over 2,000 people attending his Sunday school class. Not physically. Actually, Zig Ziglar was way ahead of his time. He was doing it this way 40 years ago. What we're doing live streaming, he was doing way back then. They had to have this big giant satellite on the church property. And it showed his Sunday school class literally around the country. Zig was an amazing guy. Had the privilege in my Bible house days to meet him because he wrote a book called See You at the Top. That title actually was a common phrase that Zig Ziglar said to a lot of people throughout his life. After he would would teach a sales seminar, after he would have a one-on-one appointment with somebody wanting to pick his brain, Zig Ziglar's comment was always this, I'll see you at the top. Guys, I want us to see each other on higher ground. You see, at the top of the mountain is where we often experience God's best for our lives. Mountaintop moments. These are moments when we ascend into God's presence and he gives us a a taste of his glory. On the mountain, God changes our perspective of who he is and who we are. In this series, We're going to look at seven or maybe eight mountaintop moments in Scripture and all different mountains. And we're going to discover what do those times and what do those seasons and what do those places mean for our lives today. God is inviting us in to experience Him maybe like we never have before. Let's make the climb and let's do it together. So let me encourage you to join us for the next 10, 12, maybe 14 weeks As we go from Mount Moriah to Olivet, from Hebron to Calvary, let's climb together. Let's breathe deep of this rare air of spiritual heights. And then then together from the mountaintops, let's shout to all the world, Jesus is Lord. Life is about climbing mountains. Somebody once asked the question, why do you climb a mountain? Do you know the answer? Because it's there. We've got seven or eight mountains filling the scripture with stories and experiences and lessons. Let's climb this mountain and let's do it because it's there. We're going to be looking at Numbers chapter 13 and Joshua chapter 14. Let's do a little mountain shopping today, okay? The book of Joshua is a study of the character that bears his name, Joshua. Joshua was the understudy of Moses. Moses was the leader of Israel. He's the one who led them out of Egyptian captivity and was the one that was supposed to lead them into the land that God has promised. It's called Canaan land. 
But when they got to the banks of the river, just on the other side of Canaan land, God told Moses, send out some spies. And, um, and then they'll bring back a report, and then I want you to go in and possess the land that we had promised to you. Moses was a mighty leader. He's the one who God gave the Ten Commandments to, and he gave them to us. And Joshua was understudy. As we read the book of Joshua, we discover that he had to step into the shoes of Moses because Moses was not allowed by God to enter into the promised land after the rebellion of the people. It was a tough challenge for Joshua. It was a mountaintop moment for him as God told Joshua these words, just as I was with Moses. Not similar, not close to, not a little bit like, but in the same way you saw my power at work in Moses, I will be with you. Now, Joseph had a sidekick. His name was Caleb. And he's the one we're really going to look at today. But Joshua and Caleb were the Old Testament's dynamic duo. We know about a lot of dynamic duos throughout history, right? Maybe the first dynamic duo ever in the history of the world was Adam and Eve. Yeah, the first famous couple. They changed the very fabric of human history. <laughs> Unfortunately, not for the better, but for the worse. And then, then here's another one. Anthony and Cleopatra. Yeah, okay. You're not, Romeo and... Julia, yeah, Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy, Mickey and Minnie, yeah, good job. Tom and Jerry, Simon and Garfunkel, Batman and Robin. Well, Joshua and Caleb were a dynamic duo. Forty-five years earlier than the event recorded in Joshua chapter 14, these two dynamic duo friends were just young men, 40 years of age. They were two of the 12 spies that were sent to check out the land of Canaan by Moses. They brought back what's been called over the history of time, the minority report. They were two out of 12 who believed after seeing all that was in the land of Canaan, that by the power and influence of God in their lives, they could conquer and possess the land. I'm going to do something I don't often do on a Sunday morning. I'm going to read a rather lengthy passage of Scripture because I've discovered a lot of people don't know this story. And so we need to get it firmly implanted in our minds. So I want to invite you to turn to Numbers chapter 13. And I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read most of it. So we're going to start at verse 1, Numbers chapter 13. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So one representative from all 12 tribes, 12 spies. I'm going to jump down to verse 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Naev and go on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or is it bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled? Are they fortified? What's the soil like? Is it fertile or is it poor? Are there trees or no trees? Do your best to, be, best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season of the first ripe grapes. When they reached the valley of Eskal, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. This is at verse 23. Two of them... Two of them carried it on a pole, along with some pomegranates and figs. Can you imagine two men needing a pole to carry a cluster of grapes? They were the size of softballs. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruits. But the people, the people who live there are powerful. Their cities are fortified. They're very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Naev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites. They live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. 
Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses. This is that second member of the dynamic duo. And he said, we should go right up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those who were living in it. All the people we saw are of great size. We saw the Nephilim. They're the descendants of Anak. They come from Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in their eyes. We look the same to them. Chapter 14 gives us the rest of the story. Verse 1, that night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt. <laughs> they were wanting to go back to slavery. Or could we have died in the wilderness? That would have been better than this. Verse 3, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? And they said this to each other. We should choose a leader to take us back. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, they tore their clothes and they said to the entire assembly, the land we passed through and explored, it is exceedingly good if the Lord is pleased with us. In other words, if we will make a decision by faith rather than fear, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid. But the whole assembly talked about stoning Joshua and Caleb. The next several verses is a conversation between God and Moses. God was very frustrated with his people and he was ready to wipe them out. Moses, being their leader, sort of pled on their behalf. God said, okay, Moses, we're going to give them another chance. But there were some conditions. I have forgiven the people, but all of those of your generation, including you, Moses, you will die wandering in a wilderness. No one but Joshua and Caleb from your generation will enter the land I promised to give to you today. The Lord replied, verse 20, I have forgiven them. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory, referring to Egypt and the signs I performed and in the wilderness, but who have disobeyed me and tested me 10 times over, not one of them will ever see the land I promised an oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Oh, but I love verse 24. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and he follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him to the land he went to. Wow, what a story. You see, the Israelites, in their journey from Egypt to the river, had been on a desert diet of manna. And now they're looking at things like figs and pomegranates and corn and milk and honey. The grapes were this big. They looked like a cluster of, of softballs. It took two men to carry it. There were different people groups who were in possession of the land. They were formidable foes. They were seasoned warriors. They were pagan idol worshipers. They didn't believe in the one and only true God. They were called Anakim. They were like an entire race of Andre the giant. Big, I mean really big people. But Joshua and Caleb didn't notice that the enemy were giants and they didn't feel like grasshoppers. Joshua and Caleb saw God and heard his promise and they remembered that God said, I will give you this land. But the congregation of Israel didn't listen. They followed the fearfully frustrated who said, if we go into that land, it's like committing suicide. So because of their sin, their rebellion, their lack of faith, God gave them a 40-year sentence to wander in the wilderness living barren and unfruitful lives. Understand this, folks. They were still the children 
of God. But they live the remainder of their lives unfruitful and barren. A whole generation of adults died off, and only the next generation coming up would enter the land along with two old men, Joshua and Caleb. There could be severe consequences to faithless decision-making. Dying in the wilderness of faithless decisions is a tragedy. Caleb was 40 years old when he spied out the land in Numbers chapter 13. Now it's 45 years later and they are in the promised land, having already experienced many great victories along the way, like the walls of Jericho falling down in front of them, like the sun standing still over the valley of Gibeon. Notice what happens now in Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. You see, Caleb, 45 years before, had done his mountain shopping. He had already picked out the country he wanted to possess. You talk about a long-term layaway plan. Caleb had put his down payment on that mountain in the land of promise 45 years before. And now in Joshua chapter 14, he's ready to claim his mountain. Here's how Joshua 14 verse 6 reads. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me and Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people shrink. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, verse 10, The Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am. 45 years later, I'm 85 years old. I love this. As yet, at 85, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then. So now my strength is for war, both to go out and to come back. In other words, I can go fight and I can come back victorious. Now, therefore, give me this mountain which the Lord spoke of that day. Wow, what a faith-filled attitude Caleb had. Caleb had picked out that mountain 45 years before, and he hasn't forgotten about it. He claimed it by faith, even though he wouldn't take possession of it for decades. Incredible patience is produced by unwavering faith. Today's passage points out that God loves to give us mountains. Mountains of our choosing. He loves for us to choose what he's already chosen for us. I firmly believe that God, God in his mighty way of working circumstances out, showed Caleb that particular mountain 45 years before. He knew it was supposed to be his. I want you to recognize the allegory reflections that's in this story. Just a a reminder of what the New Testament says about the Old Testament. Galatians chapter 4, verse 24. Paul wrote these words. These things are written as an allegory. For these are the two covenants. One from Mount Sinai that God gave to Moses. And we'll look at Mount Sinai in the weeks to come. The things of the Old Testament have a bearing on the things in the New Testament. Because of Mount Calvary. So we can look back not only at the historical accuracy of these old stories, but we can also learn lessons for life as they were written as an allegory. An allegory is the picture of one thing in the image of another so we can understand its significance in our life. So this story of Joshua and Caleb and the land of Canaan, let's just highlight those three things real quick. Canaan, the promised land. That's a picture of the victorious Christian life. We sometimes in our hymnology sing about it as it being heaven, but that's inaccurate. You see, in Canaan land in the Old Testament, there were still enemies to fight. 
there were still circumstances to overcome. When we get to heaven, there are no more enemies. There are no more circumstances that need to be overcome. This is about the quality of life that God intends to give to his people. For the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, it was actual land and territory. For you and I today in the New Testament period of time, it is about the quality of the Christian life that we can live when we surrender the territory of our own mind, emotions, and will to the authority of Jesus Christ, who as our Savior bought us with the price of his own blood now wants to come live in us and do through us what we can never ever do for ourselves. He wants to overcome the giants and the enemies that Paul talked about when he said, though I'm a believer, there is this battle going on within me all the time. The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do do. Oh, wretched man that I am. And the Lord Jesus has come to give you and I the victories in our daily walk with Christ just as he provided what was necessary so that the children of Israel could have the land of Canaan in the Old Testament. The character of Joshua is a picture of of the coming Messiah, of Jesus, our leader. And Caleb, he's a picture of you and me. If we'll have a heart of faith like Caleb did, if we'll choose to wholly follow the Lord, we could have the mountains that God has chosen for us. Canaan is the promise of faith. Joshua is the object, the person of faith, and Caleb is the product of faith. Let me highlight three things real quick. Caleb's surrender. We notice in in, in verse 8 and verse 9 of Joshua chapter 14, Caleb wholly gave his heart to the Lord. Caleb said about himself in verse 8, I brought back word to Moses as it was in my heart. I wholly followed the Lord my God. Moses said about Caleb after he heard the report, so Moses swore on that day, the land where your foot is trodden shall be yours. Why, Caleb? Because you have wholly followed the Lord. And God said about Caleb in Numbers 14, 24, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel, I'll give him this land. Caleb held back nothing. Caleb gave it all to God. All that he is for all that God is. Did Caleb sing the hymn this way? I surrender some. Some to Jesus, I surrender. Some to him, I freely give. In case you don't know that old hymn, let me share it with you the way it was originally written. It doesn't say some. The song goes like this, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him and in his presence daily live. I surrender, I surrender all, all to thee my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Some think that complete surrender is just for preachers and missionaries, but I want you to know that's 100% wrong. Surrender is the calling for all Christians. And by the way, God deserves it all. Jesus was a dying sacrifice, and he calls you and I to be a living sacrifice. It was D.L. Moody, the founder of Moody Bible Institute, the great revivalist of another generation. He started out his life as a career shoe salesman. He was saved and became a Sunday school teacher then a preacher, then an evangelist. Did you know that he preached for years with very little power and influence and success in his life? But there was a turning point. One day, he heard a preacher by the name of Henry Barley preach a message, and in that message was this line, the world has yet to see what God can do in and through and with a man wholly and completely committed to him. Moody heard those words. And that evening he prayed this prayer. By the grace of God, I'll be that man. And that unlearned, uneducated shoe salesman became one of the greatest evangelists of all times, winning hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. He held back nothing, giving everything to Christ. And at his core, he was just a businessman. That reminds me of a story I read some time ago. I've shared it with you, I think, before. There was a chicken and a pig who were walking past a church building one day when they noticed the Sunday morning sermon posted outside on the bulletin board. The sign said, helping the poor. They walked away when the chicken suddenly came up with a suggestion. 
He said, Brother Pig, why don't we give all the poor people a nice breakfast of ham and eggs? Pig thought about that for a moment and he replied, that's all right for you to say, Brother Chicken, because for you, it's only a contribution. But for me, it's a total sacrifice. How would you self-identify today? Pig or chicken? See, not everybody can be a Joshua and lead the people into the land of promise. Joshua didn't think he could be a Moses. But, but here's what I, I want to assure you today is all of us can become Caleb's. Faithful, faith-filled supporters, right-hand men and women to the activity of God in their life. Um, not only do we notice Caleb's surrender, but we notice Caleb's strength. Where did Caleb get his strength from? In verse 6, in verse 10, in verse 12, he says four times, the Lord said, as God said, the Lord spake. Caleb's strength was found in the words of God. Caleb's battle axe was the word of God. Caleb had a mountain to conquer, and his strength and his confidence came from the fact that God had given him his word and his promise to him. You see, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and what? Hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. I don't know what kind of mountain that's in front of you that you need to claim, but I know this. We need to saturate ourselves in the word of God. We need to strengthen ourselves with the promises of God so that you and I will be fully, wholly dependent upon the Son of God. Don't put all your energy into trying to conquer and claim it all on your own. Take time. Sit and soak and be still in the Word of God. Meditate in a marinade of your marvelous Messiah. Isn't that a good line? I like that. Meditate in a marinade of your marvelous Messiah. Do what, 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 what New Hope has been doing with the help of Andrew online on Facebook. Find shelter in the Word of God. It's a far better shelter than even your home. Find shelter in God's word. Caleb's surrender, Caleb's strength, Caleb's strength brings us finally to Caleb's struggle. Mountaintop experiences are not, are often filled with struggle. Climbing to the top of a mountain is not easy. It's hard. We often have to sit and rest. We'll often face challenges we don't know if we can overcome. That's true in Caleb's struggle. First off, we notice that there were negative people within his own family. Verses 7 and 8, mark this down, nothing great happens absent of struggle. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant, sent me to spy out the land. I brought him word again as with my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Just because you're part of the family of God doesn't mean God is going to give you the mountain. you got to trust him. There could be no victory without a battle. The door of opportunity swings on the hinges of opposition. Often the majority is against the will of God. We'll have to swim upstream and not go with the flow. Caleb had to overcome short-sighted negative people. They were supposed to be trusting God. I mean, after all, God had provided him a way of escape out of Egypt. Remember the 10 plagues? Remember the dividing of the Red Sea? God provided manna for them in the desert so they could eat. He provided fresh water out of places you would never expect it. God revealed his constant, consistent presence with them by giving them a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. But the devil used, the devil used the people in Canaan land and he used Caleb's brethren and as a result, a whole generation missed out on the promise. Caleb's peers missed out on God's blessing, but Caleb didn't. Caleb didn't allow the fear of opposition and the frustration of waiting. Because remember, Caleb had to wait 45 years to inherit the mountain. I'm thankful that the Wright brothers overcame the many who said, if God wanted us to fly, he would have given us wings. I'm thankful that Thomas Edison overcame the many who were fine with candles and kerosene, and we now have lights. I'm grateful that Alexander Graham, Barrel, Alexander Graham Bell was called a fool for his efforts to try to talk to somebody in a remote location. And now all of us, I have it somewhere, carry a phone in our pocket. 
Henry Ford had a dream of mass producing cars so that everybody could afford one. He overcame the many who said, we've got horses and buggies. Who would want one of those mechanical contraptions? Uh, by the way, Ford did it in his day with sweat and struggle. He didn't get any grant money from Congress. I'm glad that Peter, Paul, and Mary didn't let fear and failure stop them. Uh, the Peter, Paul, and Mary I'm talking about is not the musical trio. I'm talking about the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul and Mother Mary. Uh, I'm glad those three didn't let fear and failure stop them from fulfilling God's purpose in their lives. Not only did Caleb have to overcome negative people around him, but also he had to overcome the giants waiting on the other side. Verse 12, the Anakim. Verse 9 of Numbers 14, Do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of this land, for they are our bread. This is what Caleb said about them. Caleb said, Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Caleb said, Those giants won't be the means of our defeat. They will be the means of our growth. We're going to eat their lunch, is what Caleb said. Caleb bellied up to the table and said, Pass the Anakim, breakfast of champions. Struggles from within and from without didn't stop Caleb from claiming his mountain. And God knows that the struggle we're in for the present is going to make us stronger for our future. We need to allow him to stretch us and exercise our faith. Our God loves us just as we are, but he loves us so much. He doesn't want us to stay the way we are. He wants us to grow and he knows that without pain, there is no gain. You can view your difficulties as obstacles or opportunities. Uh, are you an optimist or a pessimist uh, or, or a realist? Faith is well-founded optimism, and God is real. And so it's realistic for a Christian to place optimistic faith in Him. In the valley you're walking through, are you walking in this valley because of your faith or in spite of your faith? See, the children of Israel walked in the wilderness for 40 years because of a lack of faith. Caleb and Joshua walked those same 40 years in the wilderness because of their faith. He's saying, Tim, well, then what difference does it make? All of those who walked in the wilderness because of a lack of faith died in the wilderness. Because of their faith, Joshua and Caleb got to come right back to that starting point. And this time, instead of experiencing defeat that they had 45 years before, they got to enter into the good of the promise that God had for them. Wow. I heard about a shoe company that sent a salesman to a remote part of Africa. Upon landing, he immediately sent a telegraph back to the home saying, Get me out of the, this place! These people don't even wear shoes! Two weeks later, they sent a new salesman to the same place. Two days later, that salesperson wrote back and said, Send me all the shoes you can! I've never seen so many prospects! Perspective. The naysayers will always be there. Don't follow them. There will be opposition from within as well as from around us. But let's move forward through dependence on Christ and let's run for the prize. Through surrender, we can have strength in the struggle and we can claim the mountains. Let me close. I understand that roses are grown in the Balkan mountains. I didn't know that till this week. They produce some of the world's finest perfume. In order to get the most lovely fragrance, the workers must pick them in the darkest part of the night. They start at midnight and they finish within two hours. Scientific study has shown that this is the interval where the blossoms give their most pleasing scent and that with the coming of day, they lose 40% of their fragrance. What's the lesson for us? Dark nights and high altitudes are often necessary for our greatest fragrance to appear and for us to be that sweet smelling influence of Christ in the world that we're a part of. 
Are you guys getting ready for some mountain moments to invigorate you for this valley walk that we go through? Then I want to suggest that we adopt the words for this arduous hike through Bible's greatest mountain peaks. The words of that old hymn I opened up with. I want to live above the world, though Satan darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught that joyful sound, the song of saints, where? On higher ground. I want to scale the utmost heights. I want to catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. The chorus of that old hymn goes like this. Lord, lift me up. Maybe you've been stuck in a rut, trapped in a valley. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Do you need the Lord to lift you up today? Why don't you invite him in? If you don't know the Lord of the mountains, why don't you invite him to come live within your heart? If you know him, but you've been stuck in a rut because of faithless choices and decisions, because of fear and frustration, why don't you stop being like Joshua and Caleb's peers? And why don't you let God make you a Caleb? He can, he will, and he does. Remember the words that changed Moody's life around. The world has yet to see what God can do in and through and with a person wholly and completely committed to him. If you've been less than holy, less than completely given to Christ, why don't you confess that to him today? Moody heard those words and he prayed, by the grace of God, I'll be that man. By the grace of God, you in the 21st century can be that person. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you that you give us valleys. Because, Father, it's often in the valleys where our lack of faith is made obvious to us. And Lord, thank you for the mountaintops because, Father, it's in seeing and scaling the mountains that we get a real sense of all your promises. It's there that we find hope instead of discouragement. It's there that we get a new perspective. It's there we're fully made aware of your greatness and our wretchedness. So, God, I pray that you will give us insight in the weeks to come as we look at the various mountaintop moments throughout the scripture, and we discover the lessons that you have preserved for us all these years. Most important of all at this particular moment, Lord, thank you for hearing our each personal prayers. Each one of us as we contemplate this challenge of what would the world be like if some of us wholly followed you. Teach us your ways, O oh Lord. Fulfill your promises in us, not only for our blessings, but Father, for the world we live in for their benefit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.